There's nuances within the culture. So my mum and dad are from different places in Ghana. My mum's half Lebanese. My dad's kind of lineage. He's from, let's call it originally, a tribe called the Gars. And they were the ones that were traditionally kind of in power, certainly around the capital kind of areas and the coastal areas. You know, when I went to visit our gran, you'd see photos of her in like mayoral kind of gowns being like carried around the town and stuff like that. She was essentially local mayor. I was interviewed by the Kennedy of the Wyden and Kennedy combination. So one of the founders. One of the founders. Interviewing you. You know, the veranda telling me stories about shooting the first Nike commercials with Spike Lee and Michael Jordan. So that was great. Point, I'm wondering how on earth you don't end up taking this job, but c carry on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so love. And I just thought, you know, I, I want to do my own thing at some point. And then I think it was the next day they called me up and said, oh, we've got a client that wants to do some media. Would you like a chat with them? And I was like, okay, let me just form a company first and do whatever <laughs> else. The hardest thing in the world when you start a new company is everyone usually goes, what have you done as a company before? Rather than go, what have you as a person done before? Mm. So they're judging you by the company rather than your own like kind of achievement and stuff well i yeah, set like, that up yesterday so can't yeah really exactly tell you anything there is nothing so that was the biggest surprise to me the fact that i was able to gain people's trust quickly how i don't know <laughs> <laughs> it just happened hi this is dina mice lamptey and this is how i became founder of the barbershop this guest we have on is one known by many for his perspectives on his key topics he connects the dots like a top class detective. Having skills on the court, this guest knows how to shoot hoops and got into the media industry through persistence and not fluke. In many parts of his career, he has been ahead of all things strategy, known for his stances on real equality for all colours, backgrounds and anatomies. So when it comes to bringing solutions, this guest can bring them amply. Welcoming founder of The Barbershop, Dino Myers Lamptey. Brilliant. Welcome. <laughs> I think that was one of your best ones. I'll yeah, take that. I'll that. take that and frame it. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So to kick off, tell us about your childhood. Where did you grow up? So my childhood, I was born in Hammersmith, London which uh, is probably one of those password things that, yeah, <laughs> the audience can get and try and hack into my accounts on. <laughs> yeah, my parents were uh, medical parents. So my dad was a doctor and my mum was a, a midwife at the time. After being born in, in England, I moved back to Ghana for about two and a half years. And then we came back to England, lived in Northwest London for a little bit of time, and then moved around a little bit depending on where you know, my dad's kind of job was. And then my parents essentially separated. Um, it's a bit of a slow separation. But, um, and, then I, and then I grew up uh, in terms of my kind of, you know, whatever, teenage school, secondary school years were in South Finland Sea after okay. commuting there for a little bit of time. And then we actually all moved there at that point in time. So for when I was about 15 years old. And um, so, yeah, so South End is, is really kind of like the place that I would consider home. So while at school, what kind of things did you excel at? Was there anything that kind of shaped, shaped where you are now in terms of the industry you're in or the perspectives you have? I excelled at knowing how to do enough and how to uh, not, get, not get into too much trouble, mm -hmm. but how to be part of the trouble. Mm -hmm. I excelled at uh, not having to be the geek in the classroom as such and work like, you know, <laughs> too hard that I missed out on the fun that happened outside of school. Uh, I excelled at balancing kind of education and sport that I wanted to play when I was allowed to play it. My dad kind of like banned us from playing sport when we went to secondary school. That so must have been tough. It, it was all right. It was fine, you know, in a sense. You know, we played a lot of football at school in terms of, you know, just for the school football team and a local club or something like that. But my dad kind of like, you know, rightfully so, was a bit like, mm, you know, didn't want us getting distracted by sport because you know his attitude was that uh teachers and people would encourage black people to do sport and you know they know they'll be good at it and they'll push them towards it and now that will overtake everything mm. you know you've been encouraged to do more and more, more of it and you won't have any time for your studies and things like that and you know and and that was you know that that was definitely a kind of like a valid point of view to, to a large degree um 
you know, we definitely did have to focus on kind of education stuff. And, you know, the whole kind of like, you know, the cliche things that you would you would hear about working twice as hard and all that kind of stuff, you know. Mm. And my dad wouldn't necessarily kind of bang on about those things. But I mean, he was a, you know, he was a, he was a, a doctor that wanted us to be doctors. Yeah, that, it was all about- It must about have been of, quite a, almost a lot to live up to. Do you feel that there was a, there was a pressure put on you guys to do well and to succeed and to, to follow in his past, follow in his path steps? Yeah, I mean, there was a massive pressure, but, um, you know, fortunately for me, it was kind of like a pressure that was, um, you know, the, the shield of that pressure was my elder sister and my brother and to a large degree that they took the full force of that pressure. Um, my, my elder sister, she did pretty, she pretty well initially in terms of, you know, she was always kind of clever and stuff. Um, but, um, you know, hard work and all that kind of stuff, but actually she was more creative than she was a science person. You know, even though she did well, you know, she, she was good at English, she was good at art, she's, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, the, the encouragement, the pressure was, you know, right from whatever age is like, well, you're going to be a doctor, you know, what kind of doctor you're going to be was more the question rather than, you know, what else might you want to do? <laughs> and, um, and, you know, so let's put some kind of like um, some support behind the reason why my dad had been quite singular about that. Um, you know, he had brothers and sisters doing all sorts of different things, uh, big family. And, you know, in, in terms of discrimination and work and security of job, you know, there's definitely a, uh, you know, a good reason to go into something that is a little bit more structured, mm. that has a little bit more support, that gives you a bit of a pension, that that need workers, you know, that need qualified people, that once you get a certain level of qualification, people can't take that away from you. That you can, you know, you can move anywhere in the world and you've still got that kind of qualification and people will always need doctors. That's the logic behind it, mm -hmm. really. Um, and a lot of people talk about, you know, kind of Afri Africans or whatever in terms of, you know, only knowing kind of four careers, you know, medicine, engineering, kind of law. And that's to some degree, that's, that's true in terms of really recognizing it. But there's a lot of reason for that because, you know, those are the professions that you've got, you know, more security behind and there's less kind of, you know, subjective discrimination likely to happen. Yeah. Having said that, he still faced it, you know. But but um but anyway, so so the pressure the pressure was gonna kind of do kind of do well. My sister took the brunt of it. She um she did really well at her um GCSEs, and then it was the A level point that really kind of like um you know was was a problem because she was doing subjects that you know weren't her favorite, and you know and what she needed was kind of straight A's really to do kind of what she wanted. She didn't get them first time round, and she resat you know, had this kind of like struggle, um, did biochemistry at university eventually anyway. And then she ended up going into banking after that. So doing nothing to do with medicine. And then I think she only really kind of like woke up to do what she wanted to do after realizing banking was a nightmare and she didn't hate like it and she hated it. And then she decided to finally make choices for herself in a sense. Um, and you know, and she's benefited massively from it, but, um, the, um, my brother, on the other hand, you know, he was he was just kind of like, you know, again, pressured in the same kind of way. But he was the first to do 11 plus because my sister was a generation of O-levels and stuff. And the, the the sad reality of my brother's kind of experience was, you know, he, he, he describes it as, you know, taking the bull by its horns. You know, he went in kind of like just into an exam without any kind of preparation. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't a school that prepared people for the 11 plus. He would have oh, been right. probably the only one doing it. And um, it was a new experience for them. And uh, he, he did it. He worked kind of hard. Well, he worked hard in the exam, but failed, and um, and that shaped him massively because I think that he went into uni he went into school, being told and been you know kind of like by my dad that he wasn't clever enough and he was a bit of a failure in that sense. So he went to school determined to prove people wrong. Okay, so you had and a motivation. Det determined to prove my dad wrong, and he sma absolutely smashed his exam. And he's had that kind of work ethic since. Mm. So your your parents were of Ghanaian heritage. Mm. Was there anything about Ghanaian culture that they instilled on you that, that, that helped you? Anything positive? Yeah, I mean, there's lots. There's lots and lots and lots. You know, there's nuances within the culture. So my mum and dad are from different places in Ghana. My mum's my half Lebanese. The, um, you know, her, her, their, pair, their, their families are, are quite different in the way in which they, they work. They, I mean, the way in which they operate. What, what are the differences? So my, my dad's kind of lineage is from the capital is you know from so from the main kind of you know, city big city africa and, and for those um, who don't know what's what's the capital accra 
and um he's 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 from um you know a, let's call it originally like a, a tribe called gar you know the gars which is kind of the you know the, the, the tribe of the city and you know kind of like, you know so quite status i guess and they were the ones that were traditionally kind of in power i guess in certainly around the capital kind of areas and the coastal areas and um and particularly kind of his kind of family side had quite a lot of kind of status and you know if you kind of follow the family tree which i haven't kind of done to that degree but my sister will tell me that oh you know all these kind of facts and things people we never heard of um but i know i know from experience actually because you know when i went to visit his uh his mum so our gran um you'd see photos of her in like um you know mayoral kind of gowns mm. being like carried around the town and stuff like that and she was essentially like some kind of like local mayor but she she was you know queen is not the right word because you know it's it's a very small kind of area and and there were no kind of kings queens in that sense but you know equivalent of to a, to a certain population area for which you get gifts and land and stuff like that you know they were kind of the product of colonialism to some degree which was still a little bit bound to it in a sense bound to those kind of traditions and this that and whatever else and was and i was respectful you know very respectful of it in a sense whereas you know my mum's side is probably more a bit more entrepreneurial just getting on with things and you know generous and you know they were much they were much more successful in that sense you know like all the brothers and sisters are doing interesting things running schools you know running kind of you know uh timber timber kind of companies and stuff like that um yeah all sorts um so, so just in terms of Ghanaian culture and learning from it whatever else i mean you know there's the obvious things i think mean, everyone works hard in ghana you see everyone working you know selling something you know trading this trading that whatever else so there's a lot of that that kind of work effort and, you know in, in any kind of hot country you go to as well there's a whole kind of like rise early you know whatever because of the sun and everything so there's there's no kind of like mm, kind of laziness in that sense but family community all the rest of it that's all kind of really strong um certainly my mum's side so you learn a lot about that kind of you know support networks and things is there anything uh yeah positive about ghana you can share with people that might not know anything about ghana so like a kind of more um yeah for someone who's completely unaware for someone that's completely unaware of ghana the one of the reasons why you'd go to ghana is because it's a country that has been relatively stable for a long period of time i mean there's a lot of african countries that are you know relatively unstable because of the effects of you know all sorts you know tribal kind of warfare lines been drawn in africa that shouldn't have been drawn when they're drawn and all sorts and um you know people being put in power that you know that shouldn't have been put in power uh people owning certain assets and things like that explain and, that for anybody who doesn't know the the in terms of the lines drawn in africa that shouldn't be there what what happened well okay so i'm the historian and uh so so i should firstly put there and there's some definitely some good books and authors and scholars and stuff to follow or youtube articles to, to basic or youtube links to basically watch but essentially you know what happened in in a long history of kind of whatever kind of africa is you know it starts with kind of slavery and the you know the, the trading of people um for which you know the western world did in terms of exchange meaningless things with people to get people to help build you know their worlds um and done in quite an inhumane way um and then you know that happened for multiple years and then in the transition of post kind of slavery which was um and before slavery ghana had an empire it was a thriving country yeah there were empires community. of africa that were were not necessarily delineated by you know as ghana as nigeria as you know togo and whatever else you know they, they, these these kind of lines came about kind of much later than than mm. that um so and that's what leads to a lot of wars right now because ultimately kind of post this kind of like slavery period of, of deciding right no longer is the slave trade morally acceptable or legal um colonialism and imperialism are things that you know and, and you know, a number of different kind of countries around the world you know did their went on their quest to acquire play you know to bring places into their empire 
and you know the british empire you know building building the empire was about going to countries and persuading them to be part of you know your your kind of country for you know for protection for money for whatever it is and it's like a it was like a giant kind of game of monopoly where you know life before that you know was was um you know uh, uh, along with that as well was the whole kind of like introduction of the, the ramping up of capitalism so you know the society was changing in terms of his economic model as well so you know it wasn't you know a lot a lot of people were living in you know whether it's like feudal or slightly different kind of basis where it was like farming and living and survival and bartering and things like that were kind of like the way of life you know make enough for the day that kind of thing and with agriculture farming and all the rest of it capitalism the need to trade mass products compared to other things and all the rest of it came into play and that's when you know this hunger for more hunger for more land more this more resource more mm -hmm. things that could be of value came about and you know by order of the queen whichever the queen is in the uk or spain or whatever or king you know people went on their missions to um you know grow their their territory and that was done in brutal ways that was done in bribery ways that was done in whatever religious ways let's say um and 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 lo and behold what happened is you know post the kind of the slavery thing uh which was so valuable to the whole world in terms of building up th building things you know yeah, i mean it just just think of it as you know incredibly cheap labor you know <laughs> cheap labor doing you know doing building your country um it gives an incredible advantage you know being forced to build build places in your country um so so what that kind of like um did was you know the um yeah there's that there's actually a um a speech a famous speech but uh i think it's lord macaulay who did a speech in 18 i can't remember the year exactly um to the british parliament that basically talks about africa and talks about how you know in in you know with, with, with slavery kind of going they had to come up with another system to govern the nature the, 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 the nation because other than that they were like you know peaceful kind of no one was kind of like whatever warring and conflicting and all the rest of it and and ultimately is an economic kind of pursuit of you know we relied on this kind of you know this resource this was you know this this place and that's in danger of going you know how do we how do we keep them part of uh our economic machine and um and you know and and you know th at that period in time as well you know with all the with kind of european nations you know whatever fighting over which parts of africa you know to, they could have you know lines were drawn to map out africa and countries and things like that there was a um, conference in in germany wasn't there where they decided okay who's gonna take what what piece with no yeah. african involvement involvement yeah. at all yeah yeah and so so many of the conflicts that you hear today are because you know they just they just drew a line yeah, somewhere drew and, lines like, and called it yeah. something yeah called it something with, yeah with most of africa being taken by somewhere apart from ethiopia being yeah. a heart that has never been conquered yeah and that i love i love the story of what happened in world war one when ethiopia was part of the league of nations mm. and Haile Selassie went to the league of nations and said italy are invading you know they're trying to they're trying to take our country this is what we're about the league of nations you were meant to come and and, and fight with us or defend us and they didn't listen for a while and he said today it is my country tomorrow it will be yours mm. and naturally as italy started to gain a bit of pace britain came and, and you know assisted mm. and they fought off the italians mussolini it was mm. you know he went back empty-handed and he was uh <laughs> he was dealt with by his people let's say yeah and uh, ethiopia stays unconquered yeah i mean that's brilliant and the other kind of stories of kind of ghana and africa i mean in Nkrumah was one of the i think it was the first president after you know the, the 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 transition from the british to the back to the to the Ghanaians. and um you know he's um uh was a was a brilliant kind of president that was you know, very philosophical but you know great at writing and thought leading and he essentially said about the need to kind of have united africa to progress again you know and until until that until kind of africa sees itself as a unit it's, it's always going to be playing kind of catch up in that sense um and you know and, and the worst um thing about you know what's kind of going on you know 
still is there's still economic handcuffs you know which still exists massively particularly like the french government and things like that the, their old colonies and stuff like that you know where there's still a, you know a, a massive kind of tax uh, that is due that's constantly been paid um and that's it it's a control of resources you know who knew how valuable certain resources were at the time um they are extremely valuable mm. um you know we've made them valuable in the world as the world has progressed and got more and more things um but i think that you know overall really in terms of the um you know that that history of africa one of the reasons why ghana is is pretty um uh, attractive to a lot of people is on one hand it was the the origins of where it all began in terms of slavery um and you know and that's a really interesting historical point you can go there and see the you know still see the castles and the the places that are you know pretty kind of horrific to think about but the people have dealt with it kind of so well and are, are joyous and nice um they are you know uh, uh, very kind of like you know english speaking in terms of as well as the other languages um they speak a lot of english you know towards the north it's a little bit kind of more muslim and some french um but um but really in terms of it's a welcoming place where you know the, the friendliness and the vibe is more relaxed and you know some other places you know in, in kind of africa which are, can be busier and more intense and all the rest of it traffic's bad but apart from that uh if you get outside of accra you know it's kind of like a, a great place and i think that a lot of people you know whether they are um from ghana or not you tend to get this feeling like a lot of you know kind of caribbean and and west indian people want to go to ghana and they make that you know a lot of americans um you know, famous Americans make that kind of almost like a pilgrimage to back to Ghana, and and they they find it's the place that they uh, they vibe with the most. I think, in terms of relate to the people and the culture, and uh, the pace of it all. Mm. But at the heart of it, it's a nation that you can kind of like trust that um, are kind and honest. I think, and it's I think an important part to mention in 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 history is you know pre colonialism, pre slavery, mm. Africa as a continent and Ghana as well is thriving mm. there's civilizations highly developed there's technology there's arts there's culture there's music mm. that's going very well um and there happens to be a lot of resources there gold diamonds mm. cobalt etc that are very attractive to a continent like europe or america which is yeah. much much younger mm. and and um and not to yeah to forget that the these civilizations were thriving before that period and um yeah the, it all adds up when you when you see that perspective mm. yeah and not not to mention the fact that you know, there are some things that are plaguing africa like they are you know a lot of nations in the world but things like uh, the plastic crisis you know the fact that you know plastic does not um disintegrate and it's it's sold everywhere and it's you know it, it gets in the beaches the the sea the animals um and um you know similarly there's some you know, important but quite sad documentaries that you will see about the whole kind of secondhand clothes market as well. How there's heaps and heaps and heaps of piles of terrible clothes that have been sent back to Africa with people sending the clothes that are not good enough for them to wear, thinking that, oh, some desperate person in Africa needs these clothes. And actually, they're just, they're just, they're just waste. You know, they're just becoming massive kind of heaps of crap because ultimately there's very little in those piles that, are, you know, that people kind of want to wear and, you know, um and um so th there is the whole kind of climate thing the whole kind of climate and environmental thing you know there's a massive responsibility that you know the the western kind of world has to take in terms of what's still going on in africa because ultimately if you if you take over a country and try and employ you know implement a system that's you know kind of like you know you want and that country isn't quite there yet it creates tensions it creates problems because one of the biggest problems in Africa, let's say, is that whole kind of like corruption thing in people in power and people getting to the top and feeling like, oh, this is their moment now. Mm. And it's almost like they've been taught uh, bad behaviors. They've been taught poor bad behaviors. They've been taught about you know, the I versus the we, mm. you know, the individual and, and, and about life being this monopoly board where you're just kind of racing to the top and, and it doesn't really matter about the others. And the, ask the question, was that there before colonialism or was it working much better? Was that level of corruption there or, or not? 
Probably, probably not, you know. And it's- I think it definitely wasn't. I think there were different systems of of kind of like leadership and control and 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 money. I mean, it's 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 capitalism really in terms of that that um has accelerated that in a sense. And it's not, not to say that anything's wrong with capitalism, but if you introduce it to a place that is kind of like, you know, without kind of setting the rules of it and going, all right, there's this, you know, there's taxes and things and things that needs to be in place and um you know there's there's kind of bad behaviors within this that we've got to watch out for if you don't kind of set those rules and it's all just like it's a bit like russia after you know the you know the fall of the ussr you know suddenly opening up fair game for you know people to own the biggest country's assets and they get sold off friends get these things you know enemies don't and then it just creates a bit of a mess Mm. um this that takes a long long time to resolve but it creates a bit of a culture of of kind of greed and um which is hard to repair because you know it's very quickly to, for people to start to think that, that that is their own people that are like that you know that, that, are, that are greedy so therefore they lose faith in their own people in their own system and i think that's uh, a large part of the problem a history lesson yes that was a great history lesson in a <laughs> continental one if you have goals and ambitions within your personal life career or business and would like to overcome the challenges that you face inspire people and get to your goals faster, then a coach might be the right solution for you. Go to weunify.co.uk forward slash coach. Now back to the show. Flying back to the UK, you finish secondary school and you go off to Sheffield University. What do you study here? Economics and philosophy. Economics and philosophy. Okay. And you're Mm. thriving there. You're doing a lot of things. You organize a student magazine, create a student magazine, you're involved in radio. Um, you run club nights, some of the biggest club nights. You run a basketball tournament that became the biggest basketball tournament in the UK for students or for, for, for people. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, this is, that's right. But actually the timing of it was that, that was started while I was still at school. Okay. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. So start that young. Um, you also hacked into the, with your friends into the university's database to get everybody's emails <laughs> to promote your club nights. Is that right? Or- Correct. Okay. <laughs> there was an apprehension there. But it wasn't, it wasn't me. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> me specifically. It was no. some, some friends we had that worked with us. I see. I get you. Yeah. Um, allegedly. Team, the team. Allegedly. Allegedly. allegedly, allegedly yeah. so. <laughs> um, so entrepreneurial spirit coming through. Mm-hmm. And... University goes great, and now it's the time to get into the world of work. And you look to get into the the, the advertising industry, and you apply to a, a lot of places. Uh, what happens next? Rejection. I mean, it was like um, you know, if any analogy can be brought back to basketball, it was like a you know a, a Kareem Abdul Jabbar, you know, like block in your face. <laughs> Did you like, get any like, interviews? Like this is not them? in this house, kind of, you know. Um, what's that, sorry? Were, were you offered any interviews in that process? No, I mean, I applied for um, every single advertising company that, you know, anyone in the street could name, all the famous ones. And every single one of them was just a rejection letter that was just a bit like, you know, a standard kind of rejection letter. But I you mean, had I, a degree. You did so many extra, extra activities. Yeah. You had a great CV. Yeah, I mean, I, I, had a, I had a CV like the Yellow Pages. I probably had too much stuff on it. <laughs> and certainly that's what kind of recruiters would say. They'd be like, keep your, keep your CV to like two pages. And I've always been like, no, no, t- say, tell your story. You know, say everything. Say everything you've done because it's interesting. And there's, there's something in it. Um, and, you know, you, wanna, you want something to differentiate you just from the fact you did a degree. The, the, imp- the important thing to probably put, put down is, is when I went to university, um, because I was doing stuff before university, you mentioned the basketball tournament. We started the basketball tournament. We organized club nights before I even went to university. And so you were doing this at 16? Yeah, 16, 17. I was only allowed to get in because I was over 18s because I was like part of the organization <laughs> committee and the DJ and whatever, you know. Yeah. But we were organizing traffic light parties. We would, we, would, um, we, would, we would supply buses from all around kind of Essex and we'd have people coming from Colchester you know, areas and you know, Bowser and outside and of town. Explain the concept of a traffic light party. Traffic light parties. Okay, traffic light parties are a, a modern day kind of dating, you know, night out, club night out. As in I say modern day, you know, at the time it was very kind of flashy. Uh, well, what will happen is you will, you will turn up in the colour, 
de- to determine your availability. So green was that you were single and you were free and you were, you were, you know, you were ready to mingle. Yeah. Red was like, no, you were taken. And orange or amber was, yeah, you might be persuaded. So playing hard to get. Yeah. yeah, So, so yeah. So just, just to allow everyone to, um, you know, wear some decent clothes that just weren't traffic light kind of shaded. We, uh, we printed badges and stuff and you could pick, everyone picked the badge at the start of the night. Some people wore three. (laughs) <laughs> okay undecided yeah. those people those up. people so why why did you mm. not get a interview even let alone a job why do you think yeah why do you think well at the time you know i i i actually called up what a time company. was this what year 2001 at the end of 2001 kind of time yeah um and at the time i um called up you know, a couple of places to try and get some feedback because, you know, the, the letter wasn't that insightful. It was a bit of a standard kind of rejection letter. And actually, sorry, to, to give a bit more context, you know, this is back down to that kind of like um, point about, you know, having uh, another point of reference to give yourself confidence that you are good enough, right, which I think is important in life. Um, my frame of reference was that I applied to a couple of graduate recruitment schemes and these were incredible. You know, I went for the ones with the biggest salaries. So this was like Mars. Smart like, great. move. Sounds good. Yeah. You know? mm. And uh, actually, the only one that I didn't go for, which had a big salary at the time, was Lidl, because that was in the days when no one knew anything about Lidl. Uh, Lidl was so cool. Didn't even know where Lidl was at the time. It was just like, what on earth is Lidl? Anyway, little did I know they were going to become one of the biggest supermarkets in the UK. Lidl, but- did you know? Little did I know. There we go. <laughs> um, so, so I um, uh, I got very far in the Mars application thing, which you know everyone wanted to get into, and and you know they whittle down from they get thousands of applications, and it goes down and down. You go through all these different kind of rounds, pretty tricky rounds, and then you finally get to the factory in Slough, which is like going to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, which sounds amazing until you see that. Oh, everyone has to kind of clock in and clock out. And they've got this really kind of, uh, you know, old school kind of militant clocking system. And if, and if you're, if you're slightly late, then you lose 10% of your salary Whoa, each month. Gosh. Yeah. If you're late for like more than two days in a month or something and you're like, Hmm, that's, that's not very kind of, you know, and this is everyone, not even, ju- you know, if, if you're not just, not just the factory workers. So it's very kind of like inclusive in that sense, but still. Less Charlie, more factory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and you've got to go out to Slough as well and the roads, you know, it's kind of like pretty tricky. But anyway, so um, yeah, factory tour, the rest of it, you know, you get to take a whole bag of chocolate back. And it was one of those years where they decide, oh, we're going to take, you know, 20 grads this year. We're going to take 10. Uh, you know, I missed out because they took 11 grads out of them. had been the last 30 or something. And so I didn't, didn't get that job, but also it was, I was hoping to get into marketing at that stage. And but I, I knew that I'd been through the certain rounds, you know, I, I deserved at least to get through other kind of, you know, two interview stages at least, because if there was something that appealed to them that got me through there, then I, I had a bit of confidence in that sense. And I applied to these kind of advertising agencies and got full rejection. I called up a couple of them. Uh, the ones I probably called up were the ones that ask for photos on your application forms when you put in the application, which I, you know, even at the time I thought, Hmm, this is surely this is not allowed these days. Um, and I just got one of these kind of account people or whatever else who didn't really know what to say, but you know, mumbled a lot of stuff about, you know, the fact that they get loads of application forms and they get all these people from kind of Oxford and Cambridge applying and all the rest of it. And I was just like, Oh, okay, that's it. If, cause if that's it, then why did they even bother saying they were trying to recruit people from different, from everywhere else, you know, mm. why not just, you know, go to the Oxford, Oxbridge careers fair. Um, so, so that was a, a real disappointment, but I didn't lose my kind of, um, uh, desire to just work in the industry in some sort of in the creative space. And I went onto the IPA website and went onto a link where they had jobs being advertised. Um, there were a bunch of jobs advertised there all for companies that had no idea what they did. They all sounded like more like pharmaceutical companies, <laughs> you know, initials and this and that and all the rest of it. Yeah. And there was Starcom, there was OMD, um, MGOMD and Mediacom. And I applied to all of them, all th- well, three of them, I think it was. And, uh, and I got three interviews. You know, it was like, hang on a minute, 100% success rate here. What's going on here? And you'd had zero success rate before that. Zero success rate. And nothing had changed in the CV. Nothing had changed there. 
yeah, absolutely nothing had changed except the fact that I had stumbled upon a different side of the industry mm. that I never knew about at the time, which was the media side rather than the creative agency side with all the famous kind of brand names on that side. And uh, so nothing changed. Interviews happened. Then these were three very different jobs as well. You know, one was a, a TV buyer, one was a planner, the other one was a press buyer. And I had these interviews. They all, you know, went went pretty well and then i got three job offers and then so not only three off uh, interviews three offers for jobs they all wanted you yeah they which all makes apparently a lot of sense me. you had a degree from a great university university of Sheffield, done all these things so what what was the difference there do you think well media was desperate that's one thing <laughs> <laughs> the media industry wasn't as as as, uh, as renowned as it is today i guess mm. um I mean, well, the, 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 the dial has definitely shifted over the years with media companies having such an influence in the world. You know, all the, you know, the Twitters, the Googles, the Facebook, and, and ultimately, you know, the, the, where the money has been spent isn't necessarily in the places that allow for the most amount of creativity, let's say, but they allow for a lot of effectiveness. So, so there's a lot of attention and therefore a lot of salaries and people and things that are happening there. It's a lot of excitement that happens in those world. And I guess the definition of creativity is changing massively. But um but really what happened was um uh I just I just stumbled upon a side of the industry that had less less barriers up, you know, that was a bit more open minded and that you know that I could evidently see by walking into the place that they had different people there. They had people who were from different backgrounds that didn't go to university, you mm. know, that were senior or whatever. Mm. Um you know, I, I ended up um, choosing uh, to start my career at Mediacom and as a press buyer, which was probably the, the, the role that I didn't necessarily like the most out of the options I had, but the team and the people I met, I was inspired by the most. Mm. And also the vibe I got from the company being there and it seemed to be going places and it seemed to have a kind of a, a genuine kind of buzz about it. And, you know, and, and in my ex you know, kind of experience and feeling is like you know that proved to be the case so you start your career into the world of advertising and media and uh things are going well and there's a certain point you get offered a job you get offered to go to amsterdam to work on one of the most respected biggest brands in the world nike with widen kennedy surely you're like this sounds great let's do it what happened yeah so that was um after I, I, I was at Medicom for a few years and I went to Mike Leaders and Bednash and then I was um, looking for a, a, another job and had a few different options. But then the Wyden and Kennedy job was something that a headhunter approached me about who I hadn't had a previous relationship with. Anyway, this job was described to me as quite possibly the best job in the world. It was, you know, working on yeah Nike, EA Games and I think Carlsberg beer. Wow. A so young for, man's a, dream. For, for a young a man, young that man. was it. You <laughs> know, on. sports, beer, gaming. You know, that's it. Retire. Sign, yeah. sign <laughs> up. Drop the, the mic line. and go. Drop the mic and go, and that's it. It's like and you know, Amsterdam. You've, you've completed yeah, well. the job world. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, Amsterdam. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. Tulips and cheese. <laughs> Tulips and cheese, of course. Yeah. But you didn't go. <laughs> no, Why? I didn't go. Um, so I am. Um, I went there and I had the you know one of the best experiences ever. You know, it was a beautifully sunny day and I stayed over. I was interviewed by Kennedy on a veranda telling me stories about shooting the first Nike commercials with Spike Lee and Michael Jordan. Wow. And you know, it who, was so like who is to explain who this is who you're meeting. So one of the, the Kennedy of the Wyden and Kennedy combination. So one of the founders. One of the founders. Interviewing you. Yeah. And the story of Wyden and Kennedy is they were the first agency for Nike. First right? agency in, for Nike, yeah. In a in a Phil Knight. Yeah. Yes. In uh what's what's uh, the country? Seattle. Oregon. Yeah, Oregon, yeah, yeah. 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 And yeah, they essentially mm. grew with as Nike grew, Wyden and Kennedy grew. Yeah. And that's so it. Beautiful. And they just retained them. And there was like their, you know, their their uh hallmark kind of client and and that's why i think i was also interviewed by them because it mattered so much to them you know it was such an important piece of business and you know i met you know all the team the creatives um the guy that i was um interviewed by a guy called dan coben i think he said him was he now works for nike in oregon um you know lovely guy everyone everyone i met was was brilliant and you know one of the one of the things that i remember most was other than him talking about the shooting the commercials or the rest of it 
Um, he described the reason why he thought that they were uniquely creative in Amsterdam and they had this something special there. So despite like them being a global company, having, you know, offices in America and the UK and the rest of it, he said that we, we make our best work in Amsterdam. And his um, logic behind it was he felt that it's because it was this kind of meeting place of like kind of different people and different cultures that were just there to do their best work. And they weren't, you know, they weren't like they'd always been in Holland, they always lived there and they haven't got kind of stale in that sense. They kind of knew they were transient in a sense. Mm. They knew they were going to be there for three, four years or something. And they knew that while they were there, they were working on the best stuff and it was going to be like, you know, the stuff that they're going to look back on and be like, I did my best work ever there. They all threw their energy together, you know, this kind of team. But ultimately, it's this eclectic cultural mix of people that was really, really interesting and made kind of different different work. So that always kind of landed with me. It's been really important. Um, you know, it was kind of like um, his insight into what made them great, which I just thought was different people, everybody. So At that was great. At this point, I'm wondering how on earth you don't end up taking this job, but c carry on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so love. No, <laughs> I was, I was, I had a long-term relationship with my now wife and she was an architect, studying architecture at the time and going through, you know, let's call it year three of seven or something. Yeah. I don't know, you know, one of the years where, you know, it wasn't very convenient to just leave. At the time as well, we were buying a house together in London and um so you know we we wanted to definitely buy the house still so the plan was becoming right okay you know i could be working monday to friday in in amsterdam and coming back on weekends or whatever else you were really and, trying to make this work yeah. yeah and as soon as you start to talk about that kind of stuff you know there's a part of you that just knows ah, it's just not going to happen you know it's not, not going to work you know mm -hmm. in terms of you know you could how long could you do that for you know um and at the time I'm trying to think of what the salary was. I don't need to mention it, but um, it was like at the time you're doing the maths and you go, oh, I'm getting paid that much more, you know. How much? Uh, I can't remember the time. At the time, I th I've got a feeling, I've got something like 70K in mind. Wow. And you were on at the time before that? Probably something like 35 or something. Whoa. So 40 it could or have something. doubled your yeah, salary. Yeah, double yeah salary. something like that. Right. Yeah. And, um, and at the time it was like, okay, you know, with that extra, you know, that could be your train, your, your plane, whatever, you know, and you could make this work. And, um, you know, so that was, you know, I, I, I was, I had convinced myself that I could try and make it work. But really the things that probably made me decide differently were the other options I had on the table. So I was also at the same time, uh, had options and I was interviewed by MEC. So, um, uh, Steve Hatch, who is now, you know, um, some incredible title at Facebook, like VP, whatever. I'm not exactly sure how to describe it, but he's, you know, totally high up and a great guy. And, uh, another example of someone who, uh, let's say was from a working class background. You'd never know, you know, you'd meet him and all the rest of it. So eloquent. And, uh, you'd be like, yeah, he's Oxbridge or something, but you know, he isn't. And, hmm. um, and he was, I think he was CEO at the time there. And, um, uh, there are people like Stuart Bowden and um, Veritza, who's now at Channel 4, head of head of sales. There were this team, incredible team of people at MEC. And I had a good friend there who's also now at Facebook. And uh, and he he's the one who kind of like, you know, told me, oh, you know, it got me excited about it. Went through the stages. Um, I actually, um, uh, Steve gave me his book in the interview. It was like, great team, really kind of excited about it. And then I thought, if it's the circle, if it's not Wayne and Kennedy's, Got to be in the MEC. And then I had an interview with Rocket. Mm. And Rocket, which was part of PhD, which um, the really interesting thing about Rocket and how that kind of came about was um, I had an interview with Rocket before when I was leaving Mediacom. Um, and there was a guy called Mark Sherwood who, you know, left Mediacom in a, in a blaze of fire. <laughs> and at the time interviewed me to try and get me over. And I went there, I remember going to this office and it was all kind of like, um, you know, really kind of like creative and stuff. I had all these kind of, you know, all this decoration inside and stuff. And it all seemed quite cool, but it was all a bit like, what do they really do? Um, and he had a bit of a chat and stuff and he was like, yeah, you know, it all seemed very kind of cool and hippie about it all. And, and all that happened in that instance is they never kind of like, they never concluded anything, you know, they just kind of took their time about, you know, recruiting that job. And by the time, you know, I'd moved on, I got to the job at Mike Lee's and Bed Nash and that was kind of it. 
anyway, they got, he got, he got back in touch, um, through probably some recruiter again, uh, and was like, oh, you know, we we're looking. And then when I went in to have an interview with them, the office was completely different, same place, but completely different. Mm -hmm. It was suddenly like very corporate, you know, it was like none of the decorate, none of the stuff that made them, them. And actually, you know, I went there and I just met really nice people that were just kind of down to earth all the kind of the fluffy stuff had been taken away actually mark was still there but then i let when I, once i got the job i found out that he was shortly leaving but it completely had this identity change mm. and it kind of like grown up in many ways uh and but the main thing the main thing that kind of appealed to me that made me choose there over widening kennedy and over mec was the fact that there were only about 30 people there at the time and it was a sense it was it was the sense that i was going to get a lot more responsibility in what i was doing and a lot more opportunity to be the calm strategy person that influenced the direction of the company in that sense there weren't people in the company with that title there weren't you know these strategy this that whatever else everyone was good account people um and you know media kind of planners but there weren't really those other people so there's an ownable space to basically kind of drive myself into whereas so, somewhere like um mec there were loads of great strategy people you'd be one of many yeah yeah that's it i see and um and then but, but, but you know with with the kind of like the deliberation that was going on with wine and Kennedy, that would take a long time wine and Kennedy actually to just just formalize an offer actually and i was just like you know, getting pressure from other places to make decisions and so I just made the decision. It's going to choose, lose. choose, choose, choose rocket. Uh, and obviously for love, for love to stay close to your. Oh yeah, of course. The relationship, wife. the relationship stayed together. Yeah. And we've yes. since had kids and all the rest of it. So, uh, the kids are thankful anyway. The kids are great. The kids think we made the right decision. <laughs> <laughs> are you an agency or brand that would like to work with our production company, unity and motion? If so, contact us at unityandmotion.com. We produce commercials and social content for brands such as Chanel, Amazon, Reebok, Harrods, The Ritz, and many more. Now back to the show. So you join Rocket, mm -hmm. and your title at the time is Comms Planning Manager. But you had a special request. What was that request? My special request was to change the title to have strategy in it. So I was like, yeah, I'm fine with the responsibility, the, you know, the relevant pain, all the rest of it. But, um, yeah, I, I wanted to have, um, uh, strategist in it. What was your thinking behind that? And what's, is there any advice there for people about choosing the right title for their career ambitions? Yeah, my, um, my, my feeling about it was the reason why I left Medicom was because not that I didn't like the company and it, I didn't think it was kind of going places, but the jobs I really wanted to do were held by very few people. They were, you know, there were a lot of people queuing up to become strategists, you know, who were doing excellent at just planning away. And to some degree, you know, it's the luck of the draw of what kind of account you work on to be able to prove that you're the next best in line to some degree. If you work on a great account that is, you know, is, is, is doing is really interested in doing lots of work or they're a big enough account then yeah maybe you've, you've, you can be more strategic and and make that case in a sense but otherwise it's a bit of a waiting game so i wanted to learn strategy i wanted to kind of get thrown in the deep end in a sense i certainly did at michael's and bednash you know i went there at a great period of time when um a lot of fantastic kind of work was happening you know with channel four as well as launching channels like more four and um kind of products like e4 music and bringing film for free to air so there was all sorts of things of learning on the job and it very much was learning on the job uh the school of michael's and bednash strategy was like here's a load of books on the shelf you know read them <laughs> mm -hmm. uh and that was an experience and a half you know just getting thrown in and having to kind of learn on the go so once you've been through that kind of uncomfortable experience where you come out of it thinking yeah i know that strategy is confusing i know that not everyone is is that good at teaching it i know that there's not some kind of like single formula to follow you know it's not it doesn't really work that it's kind of like a way of thinking you you, you don't want to lose that from your title because it's such a valuable thing that so few people have and people see you completely differently once they know that you're a strategist compared to just the planner or whatever mm. um so i didn't want to kind of regress in that sense um you can always get a planner job once you, you know, you've done planning but you can't um 
you know, the sto- telling the story of why you went from a strategist to a planner and then you wanted to become a strategist again is a d- very difficult thing to do. Yeah. So what happened next in your career? Where did you go? In terms of the rocket side or after post rocket? After. So uh, I was at Rocket for four and a half years. At that stage, I didn't really think I was going to join another media agency. I thought I'd probably try something quite different. And then um, I was contacted by the same person that contacted me about the Wyden Kennedy job, uh, the recruiter, and told about something else. Another and dream job. Ooh, another dream job. Another dream position. Well, he told me about a company that I had been reading about and hearing and seeing making you know, interesting kind of moves. So the company that we're talking about was the Seven Stars. So he approached me about the Seven Stars and you know, I'd heard a bit about it and I'd seen them and I was just like, this is really interesting because they're an independent company, small company, and they seem to be growing. And they're growing by being kind of small and it doesn't seem to be stopping them from growing. So they're growing by doing the things that you know, we say you can't do, like be small and have buy-in power. But yet the story about the Seven Stars were, was they were, you know, ultimately specialized in buying. You know, they were, the, the founders were from buying backgrounds. So, um, you know, I was like, they must be doing something right. Um, and they must be convincing the market that you can do it differently. Mm. So anyway, so I had the conversations and the, the exciting thing about the Seven Stars was they, they, they wanted to build out planning and strategy and, you know, and start to get a reputation in that space. So that was really exciting, this kind of idea of, you know, doing something new, doing something different and growing something. And yeah, again, owning something is an exciting journey. So I went. So you were thinking you would get a piece of the pie of this company one day? Is that the goal? Yeah, I mean, the ambition of going to a a fast rising, small, independent company, you you get to a stage in your career where you're just like, okay, you know, there's work. And there's like, how do you fast track to where you want to get to, in a sense? Um, and the most, um, you know, the industry story is ultimately people benefiting the most by by creating something and selling something, you know, and that's how the industries have grown and how big groups have grown by acquiring companies or the rest of it. And, um, you know, that's almost kind of the way, the, the way out, in a sense. And I, and that was my my frame of mind, you know, join a company that that is rising, that is going to be, valued at a certain amount that will sell and you will benefit and great and then and then maybe you can do your own thing mm. and i guess in terms of you know with that kind of like experience and success and doing what we were doing you know we wrote we grew massively um and you know but not just kind of grow grew in terms of you know clients and revenue and stuff but grew, grew in terms of reputation and culture so you know it was a sunday times best 100 companies to work for a small company for for five years in a row top 10 oh, brilliant things like that which were just kind of incredible things incredible culture and and i guess in terms of but it gets to a stage for me which was like um you know the company was doing so well that the plan didn't seem to be going in how i thought it would be in terms of in five years time i'll be doing something you know we'll sell mm-hmm. and whatever and um and then i was approached by you know someone else uh, about doing something different and and i just thought you know i, I want to do my own thing at some point and you know, so I could be t- I, I could be too comfortable at Seven Stars for many many years, I but I would carry on working for the same employer because it was it was a great place to work yeah, and it was fine. Yeah. And but you, you realise you weren't going to get that slice of the pie, maybe, and it's maybe not going to sell anytime soon because they're just yeah. growing. Yeah. And they are now the UK's largest independent media agency, right? Yeah, that's mm-hmm. right. Yeah. So was there an element of golden handcuffs to the situation? No, I think it's just the element of, you know, the there are many examples of companies that don't need to sell, you know, and and people still enjoy it. Mm-hmm. People still enjoy work. They still get paid well. They still yeah. kind of live in kind of good lives. But it's a different life from the one that, you know, I, I would, I would, I was the kind of, I am the kind of person that, if I was to look back and have any regrets, and it was like, well, I, you know. I didn't get to see what would happen if I did my version of this thing or whatever else. You know, that's the most exciting thing to me in terms of, you know, life, like, like playing around with different things and seeing if different things work and what the possibilities are, what it might create and ideas and, you know, and, and making them happen. So, yeah, so it was, you know, it wasn't a question of golden handcuffs. I mean, a lot of people can get to a certain stage in their careers where, you know, the golden handcuffs are, the kids are in private schools, <laughs> they got big mortgages mm. and all that kind of stuff and then it's just like you know you got to stay i um have lived my life trying not to get too kind of like um 
tied down by these things because then you become a you know a slave to the thing that you're doing mm -hmm. and you don't have options and not having options is a, is a sign of kind of poor wealth i guess really because you know everyone will say to you about once they've made their money they'll say on oh, no, a time is more valuable than money mm -hmm. um which is the reality whether you you know you've made the money or not but you know you can't really see it when you haven't got money because you know you need money to survive and get things but there's definitely a, a limit you know i think even satisfied studies have been done globally about you know what's the amount and i think i can't remember what the number is but it's around that seventy five thousand mark for example that once people start a bit above that they don't actually get any happier um their, their, their net kind of happiness they might buy more stuff but their net happiness doesn't actually improve mm. which is a really interesting thing so you know you, you you start to think about oh what are you willing to trade to you know keep your happiness going up <laughs> and actually that's probably oh i don't want the responsibility of you know 100 people relying on me to do this thing or whatever that kind of thing you know, different people will have different things okay so if, if we if we were to move forward just a little bit you're you, you decide or you're invited to go on a frontier trip to the usa with ipa oh mm -hmm. uh, yeah and what trip did you say and just frontier it? trip frontier yeah <laughs> that's, that's what I've got down here. A what's, frontier trip. What's a frontier trip? You've never heard of frontier trip? It's like, what is that? <laughs> that's not a word I would have put in naturally. <laughs> I think you just created something. Yeah, um, I don't can know we go is. on your frontier trip? Yeah, they call them missions. Oh, there you go, frontier mission. <laughs> oh, okay, so you did put the word in there. Do so you think they're the same thing? <laughs> oh, I I frontier you put that <laughs> coming to a city near coming you. Coming to a city near you, yeah. <laughs> so, so you're on this mission hmm. in the USA and you're approached by someone. Who was it and what was this conversation? Oh, the, 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 the IPA mission trips are... You know they're done with the uk trade and industries and they are essentially designed to encourage the exchange of trade between the uk and other countries in the world so when it comes to the advertising kind of mission um they invite a group of senior people to go and have an experience where you get a lot of high profile meetings with a lot of high profile companies yeah. that might want to some way or form do business or increase the relationship relations with you so we had a west coast mission which was you know an exciting one because it was silicon valley and uh and and la as well mm. so it was a mixture between the tech side and the kind of hollywood hollywood and, yeah hollywood side. yeah yeah so it was, it was brilliant but ultimately it was a bit like you know we were on a bit of a kind of school bus kind of thing there was about 20 of us um that were just spending a lot of time together whether in the bus or in a meeting room meeting you know people from another company and um and we so we got a lot of time to spend together talking about things and uh i always remember like the one thing that we clocked on to really kind of early was why americans always say no matter what question you ask them they always respond with that's a great question <laughs> that's a great question <laughs> and we we challenged ourselves with trying to work out whether we could actually deliberately ask a really dumb question and still get the same response <laughs> that was Did it work? that was possible okay, yeah. okay. You're right. <laughs> there's a limit too. there's no such thing as a bad question in america um they're all great anyway so yeah so we spent a lot of time and whatever else and you know, met yeah, a lot of people that i that i that are still in the industry today really high up and senior because they're all ceos at the time anyway mm -hmm. and that this was only in 2015 or something and um yeah, and one of them, I mean, it, it wasn't necessarily, I, th I think we, we had conversations on buses and things like that where there were remarks about, oh, you know, recruiting me. I mean, I was probably one of the only people that wasn't a C CEO on that bus. Mm -hmm. and, and I, but I think I was one of the people that could ask good questions. Anyway, and that kind of got picked up, I guess. And, and uh, you know, so one of the CEOs, uh, a guy called Dale Gall, uh, he was like, oh, you know, we should stay in touch and whatever else, that kind of where thing. Where was he CEO at? Uh, Prefero at the time, I think okay. it was. Um, so yeah, he was here at Prefero at the time, and then he um, he left, and uh, or oh, we left. Sorry, as in we left, we finished the, the the tour, the mission, the frontier. Yeah, the frontier, <laughs> the final frontier, and then we went back to our day jobs. And I don't know, a year or so later, you know, he was in touch about trying to like recruit me for a, for a job or whatever. And I was like, no, no, I'm not interested. Whatever, I'm not not looking to move. And I really wasn't. And then about a year again later again same thing happened but he had a different role where he was the ceo of um of, of, of mullen low and 
and was like, look, there's something really interesting going on. I've just been put in this position, you know, newly kind of merged companies coming together, all this kind of stuff, you know, rebranding this, that, whatever else. And Modern Low is a huge advertising organization. Yeah. Big company. Yeah. A huge organization that, well, the low part of it has, is one of them, you know, one of the most famous kind of advertising agency names of old, you know, work with brands like Unilever for, for years. That's like proper kind of mad men days kind of company in a sense, mm. uh, in terms of by reputation anyway. Uh, and then the Mullen bit was a relatively new, but fast rising, really successful agency in America. And, um, you know, the, the low group essentially bought the Mullen part, but, you know, named it that way and changed the, the, the people that were running it, I guess. Um, so, yeah, and part of the interpublic group ultimately as well. So they his kind of brief and mission was to try and deliver this kind of full service proposition. So he approached me about having some kind of chief strategy officer kind of role at the time. And I wasn't interested. I wasn't interested in just doing a similar kind of role somewhere else. Why not? So you're, but you're, you've never been a C-level role. You're head of strategy. Was that exciting to be, oh, chief strategy officer? Well, I really? mean, okay, the seven stars, we didn't have titles, you know, in terms, really, you know, it's I like, see. I was like kind of head of strategy, but we, you know. Effectively, by, you were I was CSO. on the board. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, effectively. Yeah. So, right. so it was just like, you know, a naming thing in that sense, in that regard. Mm. So I, I wasn't, you know, it wasn't, didn't care about the title in that sense. But I cared about the role and what it was doing. And, and you, did, by this point, you're really quite keen on starting your own thing at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, yeah. I, for the for the for the experience of the seven stars taught me that you could be a small agency and rise and grow and have a successful business. And also, the market was changing. I saw the reasons why seven stars were successful because the dynamics of the buying market had changed. It wasn't just about being big, um, but also in terms of the world of like transparency and deals. You know, you really could get good good deals by being agile and flexible for clients. You know, you could get them better deals. Grey Matters new business tip for today. Create strategic partnerships with other complementary agencies. You can refer leads to each other's businesses, learn from each other and gain access to each other's networks. Grey Matters is a straight talking business development consultancy that empowers agencies to position, market and sell themselves for new business success. And then really, I mean, it's what kind of like what Dale said that tipped it in a sense, because he was like firstly looking for me to fill a role that I wasn't you know, looking to say yes to. And then he came back and changed his mind and said, um, look, I was recruiting for a managing director position as well, but I think that you can do that. Ooh. And would that interest you more? Oh, curveball. Um, yeah. 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 Curveball. And what did you think? I thought, yeah, that's interesting. It makes it more interesting. But I didn't, I didn't think, you know, yes, definitely. I thought what made it interesting was, you know, I was going to be doing a role with responsibilities and things that I had to learn that I wouldn't ordinarily be doing at seven stars, you know, you know, there's still going to be things, to, new things to experience and all the rest of it, but it was interesting. These are interesting new things that, mm -hmm. that I felt that, you know, one day would just be beneficial if I did my own thing, which yeah. was inevitably they were. I mean, the, the thing that really flipped it though, I say, you know, not just the title thing, but it was something that Dale said, which was, he said, he said, um, you know, what's the worst that can happen? He said, in five years time, we could be celebrating, that we've done it. We've brought back the full service dream and we've done it. We've created this you know, incredible thing. We're like heroes. He said, um, or in two years time, it all goes wrong. And f it, what's the worst that can happen? We'll go off and do something else. <laughs> and I was like, great. I was like, that's, that's, that's the tipping point for me because it was just like, you know, we will go in a sense of like, you know, like, right. I am dragging you away here with a sense of commitment to, if this goes wrong, it's on me to help you and all the rest of it. And also just this idea and this attitude of, yeah, it could go wrong, but life, you can just carry on, you know, you know, it's not like, okay, it goes wrong. And then that's it. Your career is over, which I think is uh, an important point. Really important point. So how, so how did it go? You, you say yes. And you're managing director for the first time. What was that experience like while you were there? And this is just before you start your now, you finally do it and you start your own thing, Barbershop, but how was the MD experience? Uh, so the experience started even before the experience began in a sense, which was part of the selling in experience was, oh yeah, we, you know, we've, we've got Netflix as a client and we're doing this great work. And, um, and I remember, um, I, you know, I had to you know, meet the team kind of whatever thing for a drink. 
and then it was like there was like yeah we've got a bit of a problem with netflix oh we've, we've lost netflix oh <laughs> we haven't even got a problem <laughs> they've gone yeah so it was like oh god we've lost netflix and then anyway like fine um, and that was like the, you know, the most exciting part about working with a company like Netflix and, you know, the work they were doing was excellent. Um, and anyway. you accepted the job at this point? Yeah, I accepted the job, you yeah. know, I'd handed my resignation, it was happening, you know, and whatever else. Um, so I was like, oh, right, that's fine. But, you know, actually, really, you know, I, I kind of accepted the job expecting and thinking that, you know, I was going to have a team of five people and I was going to be building it from that kind of level and, you know, going out and having to, like, grow a company and all the rest of it. And, which I thought, yeah, great, you know, it's that's kind of like what I want to do. So it didn't really bother me in that sense. And actually, the interesting thing is, is that when I actually arrived, the company was in a better shape in in certain ways. It had recently won Eurosport, which was, became a huge account um, because of what they were doing, launching this kind of Eurosport player thing. Um, and that was a full service account and everything. But um, but what it meant is they suddenly kind of they they, they hired a lot of people. I think that um, weren't necessarily the right people for the job. Anyway, so that was just an experience and a bit of a whirlwind. But, you know, by and large, you know, we, we got it together and got some really strong people in, recruited well and create, creating a culture, doing all the things that we're setting out to do. And then <clears throat> 10 months later, unfortunately, Dale, the CEO, decided to leave. Um, the man that sold you the vision. Yeah, he yeah. you the he dream. had this dream <laughs> yeah. in five years or two Earlier years. Earlier than two years. Right. <laughs> yeah. That was the worst case scenario two years. So I know, exactly. Worse, I'm like, we didn't months. talk about this scenario. Mm. <laughs> you kind of like not even lasting two years. So what did you think? Were you like, I can, I want to leave too? Or? Yeah. It was like, was man's got to do what a man's got to do. In a sense, you know, in terms of, it must have been that bad or that important for him to leave. You know? Um, so what happened next for you? It's not necessarily, I mean, when some of that happens, it's not necessarily... You know, he might have kind of made this, whatever he made the decision, whatever decision he made, is not really necessarily completely, it's not the way he wanted to do it. You know yeah. I mean? you know, mm. He wasn't just like, you know, lying about the fact that he mm. wanted this to, this thing to be successful in five years' time. It was like, no, he, you know, it, it, time was up. Um, so, so what did I, what was the question, sorry? So you're, you're thinking, okay, this, this dream's over. Do I continue? Or, I wasn't or? really thinking that, and I wasn't thinking the dream's over. I just thought that, you know, the dream with him was kind of over in that sense. Mm. And we still had a really good company, a really okay. big thing, a really, you know, kind of, we were growing and all the rest of it, good culture in terms of my bit. Yeah. Um, and, um, and then there was the new CEO that, that came in. Um, so, you know, the new CEO is appointed and you, you want to give them the benefit of the doubt and hope that they just, I guess, you know, are aligned with, you know, what you had bought into in terms of the reasons why you were there. And, um, and that process took a little while to settle, but, you know, there's some personal reasons on the CEO side and all the rest of it for them to fully get their feet underneath the table. And, um, and I guess, um, you know, when, when it did settle, it was just, um, you know, I kind of like felt that the company culture was different, the direction was different, and the vision was different. And, you know, it wasn't what I had kind of like originally bought into. And there were a lot of people that were loyal to the other CEO that were leaving for various reasons. And it was just like, okay, you know, just the same way that when I left kind of Rocket, I wasn't looking to join a necessarily another media agency. You know, I was looking to join a specific thing, which was the seven stars. Mm. It was the same way that that's the reason why I joined, you know, the original kind of Mon alone that sense. And it wasn't, it wasn't becoming that thing anymore. Um, and then I was approached by people who wanted to do joint ventures with me. And also, um, you know, and I knew these people, I wasn't really ready to leave in a sense, because I felt that, you know, I had to do, you know, I had more, more you know, we were going in a good direction, had a lot more kind of time and um to deliver and um and actually something 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 happened also kind of you know i guess enhanced things actually we lost the creative for the the, the eurosport part and you know so, so suddenly it's gone eurosport's gone yeah well the, the creative the creative, some, some of it you know so it's still in under my bit it was still kind of happening right. yeah um but it was a very different kind of relationship at that point because of the way in which we work with this client and all the rest of it so to explain, and, that means you're no the, the company you're with is no longer making the content, mm, the adverts, let's say. Yeah. But you are still choosing when they're placed on TV or Yeah, or exactly. Doing the media planning, the pace placement, the mm -hmm. the investment side of things. 
And essentially, what happened was, which um, which was uh, which was which was which was not great in a sense, was um, the contract was one single contract. So when they gave the notice for the creative thing, automatically it meant that there was there was time was ticking a little bit, and we were we, we were still working on media. We were still kind of like confident and being told we should be confident that it was going to stay and all the rest of it. But inevitably, as it gets close to the end of the contract, they they created a bit of a pitch process and were a bit like you know submit your pricing type thing and whatever else. And then they decided last minute to take that bit and go somewhere else. Or oh, they wanted to bring it in house was their view, mm. but um, but they kind of like went you know, via somewhere in the process, and um, yeah, so that kind of like men, you know, suddenly it was like a very different job, you know. Yeah. Um, it was like wow, you know, something that was such a a big part of the company in that sense, and then suddenly got all these uh, these uh, you know financial kind of pressures and things that um, that you know, kind of make the place a, 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 a not as a creative place as it should be, really. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's always an experience, but you're not necessarily doing the work that you want to be doing and the things you want to be doing. And you're not, you know, it, it was it was a bit annoying not to be in control of your own destiny in that sense. So what's the moment that the barbershop? So the, the moment of the barbershop, becomes... you know, when, when you advise other people about, about the, the things that they're asking you to potentially be involved in, like a joint venture or whatever else, you know, you, you give, you say, all right, this is what you probably need and whatever else, that kind of thing. You know, I quickly realized that, you know, if, if, if I was going to do something, I wouldn't really want to do a joint venture necessarily in that form, but I'd be, I would want to do something myself, you know, mm. and, um, and that was kind of it really after sketching down a bit of a plan, I kind of like thought, okay, actually, and you're still it makes it MD at this point, sketching out a plan and working it out. Well, no, not really. No. I mean, that was little, I was thinking about other people's businesses I in see. terms of, you know, I, someone spoke to me in an interview, you know, a couple of people about, you know, oh, would you be interested in this? And I was like, no, because I'm still doing what I'm doing here. But if you were going to do it, you know, this is how, what I think you need to, I see. you know, okay. if you look for yeah. someone, whatever else, you know, systems tools whatever to give them an idea about kind of cost and structure and stuff and um yeah and that, and that was and that was it really but it then triggers the whole like, you know once you write something like that down or whatever you're just a bit like okay you know actually i could yeah, use that yeah yeah exactly this is this is this is it doesn't it makes it less daunting it's something like oh mm. you know actually it doesn't take that much you know um and so anyway so so when um you know, I, I kind of had that kind of trigger spark the mind on all the rest of it. You know, there were the various kind of changes happening in, in, uh, in, uh, at Mullen Low and we had a, you know, I, I was able to have a conversation and basically say, I'm interested, you know, like, you know, let's, let's, let's move on, you know, because this was, it wasn't the type of place, it wasn't the place that I wanted to be, it'd be at, you know, um, so you had to let, who did you let know? And what did you say? You just said, I'm, I'm not feeling it here. Uh, I, I mean, I mean, yeah, you know, the, you know, I, I, I had in mind, you know, it was time for me to move on and I wanted, to, I needed time to plan what I was doing next, which was going to be my own thing. But you don't, things like that you don't really want to announce because you haven't really thought about it well enough. You haven't, you don't really know how viable it's going to be and, and whether at the end of it, you're going to decide, okay, that's what I want to do. Um, so you, but you need to go through the process. Whenever you're you know, at a place, you can't dedicate any time to other things, really. You're just consumed by that thing, you know, the, what you're working on at the time and the team and all the rest of it and all their kind of, all the immediate fires that you're, you're dealing with. So it's only really until you can negotiate yourself to get time and space to do it properly, which is, you know, which is, which is kind of what I did. So I was able to, um, you know, negotiate an exit that allowed me to give myself time and space to, do the next thing. What would it, you know, for someone else who's thinking, you know, who's mm. in a role mm -hmm. full time, love to start their own thing mm. and is consumed by everything. What, how did you negotiate that? What did you negotiate that someone can learn from? Um, I mean, I think that in terms of, you know, there's a basic economics of business. If you lose a big kind of client, you know, people are going, oh, how are we going to save money? And if you see in a company that, you know, other people are leaving and all the rest of it, you know, the conversation, I mean, you know, you're constantly in a, in a position like that. You're constantly talking to your, you know, your CFO or whatever about, you know, the profitability, the this, the that, you know, the cost, the ins and out. And you're looking at spreadsheets and you're going, how can we save money? Or, you know, and then you're looking at people asking for pay rises and all this kind of stuff, you know. And, you know, you're, you're, you're in the maths um, and you've got to come up with ideas. You know, you've got to come up with ideas about how to do things, how to restructure things or whatever, that kind of thing. So, so it's not really a, um, a thing in terms of, you know, uh, it, it's your job to, 
come up with thoughts mm. on you know resolving certain things yeah. and what was your thought and solution well my i mean that, that was it i mean you know my thought and solution is you need to make cuts you know i need to you know well, i'm i'm inter you know, i'm interested in doing you know um something else now um so you can save money there you can reach i mean after that it's kind of like you know it's over to them to work out you know but you know in terms of ultimately if you need to make cuts and whatever else and you know i didn't necessarily want to be the one responsible for after to you know to, 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 to for the future that they have got a vision for if you know what i mean you know yeah. that's their vision that they you know want to create in a sense you know but but for the vision that i had you know it was it was that was no longer the the strategy if you know what I mean. So, so what did you do? Did you ask for like reduced time and a reduced salary to help no, no, with costs? No, 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 no. I mean, it's it's just a negotiated exit. You okay. know, I guess I don't, I don't know what the terminology of it is. Right. You know that, I mean? that, that makes sense. Yeah. Negotiated exit makes yeah. sense. You know, yeah. you, you came to a term and, and you, you stepped away from it. Yeah. What, what did you do after that? Was there some time where you kind of sat and thought? Did you go on holiday? Like what? What happened after you left? I mean, what happened after I left was. Um, yeah i mean i think that you feel like okay you know yeah, you got time whatever else but you know you still you, you i had enough energy to still want to do stuff so um i actually went and you know i just had a conversation with people you know, people that i knew that you know were um doing things just to talk and say oh you know just to really to kind of like help to think make me think through you know the my plan and what i wanted to do and i went and had some conversations with people and actually i had a conversation with someone that was interested in me working with them before and um and and that's what kind of led to um uh an introduction they basically said that look it would have been great if we had some kind of relationship and had some kind of partnership with with someone of your skill set you know in terms of how they were talking about it and they they said that um you know maybe we should you know, stay, stay in touch and whatever else and keep us up to date about you know what you're doing and how you're doing it and then um and then I think it was the next day they called me up and said, oh, we've got a client that wants to do some media. Would you like a chat with them? And I was like, okay, let me just form a company first and do whatever <laughs> else and do all that kind of admin logistics, whatever. And um, anyway, I went and had a chat with them. Did and you set up a company before chatting with them? Uh I'm not sure how quickly it takes to set up a company, but it, it all, you know, it all happened in around a very <laughs> close Seven, period 14 of time. days or something to get your letter. Yeah, so I put the application in. Really? Well, I don't know. I don't and know, that yeah. was the barbershop? Yeah. Yeah. So the next day, the next day, literally, um, I spoke to a client or whatever. The company was formed. Um, and then, and then I call it the barbershop. I call it, you know, so I call it TBS Partners. That's the name of our company because, you know, I abbreviated it. And I was, I was, you know, I was thinking, I'm not sure if this is the name I want. I'm not sure, you know, if I'm going to start this with other people or not. Um, had so many unanswered questions that I didn't want a name that w I was going to choose that I was going to later regret or, mm. or if I got someone else involved, they wouldn't like, and it was just like, you mm. know, so I just kind of abbreviated it and, um, but had in mind the barbershop as the name. And, uh, and then I kind of like had a bit of a tease campaign, let's say, you know, in, in a, you know, just in terms of telling people it's called TBS, I'll announce it at another date kind of thing um and then yeah anyway so then i, I you know I, I got i got the f first client very very quickly that's and start, nice a nice start start. revenue yeah. brilliant and this is tw april 2019 no may yeah may may 2019 mm. and how has it been since then so you get your first client and and you're off yeah um so uh get my first client um i'm off um you know, working out how to do things along the way. I'm still deciding what kind of company I want and whatever else in terms of want to create. And I'm speaking to people, more maybe about personnel, people, team, other co-founders. And there are others that I'm pro uh, approached, other, others that are interested, others that we spend time with. You know, it was all kind of like just, you know, doing the planning work really in terms of, uh, you know, the company and the proposition. But meanwhile, there were, there were people that wanted kind of campaigns and things done and and through whatever introductions, we had we you know, had work, um, which was very helpful. And what are you most proud of in the the, the barber shop journey? The, the fact that peop the first people actually paid me any money, you know, like like the hardest thing in the world when you start a new company or a company is everyone usually goes, oh well, what have you done before? And what's your you know? 
what have you done as a company before rather than go what have you as a person done before mm. so they're judging you by the company rather than your like, own kind of achievements and stuff well i you're set like, that up yesterday so can't yeah really exactly tell you anything yeah. there is nothing there's nothing that i've done before yeah. but my illustrious career i can talk about but they're not yeah and but rightfully so they are worried about things like finance and you know the, the boring stuff's a business which is kind of right is their money safe with you kind of thing you know yeah um are you going to go bankrupt which is all you know a, a, a much bigger deal with media in particular when you're dealing with large sums of money where you're investing on their behalf mm. so that was the biggest surprise to me the fact that i was able to gain people's trust quickly how i don't know <laughs> <laughs> it just happened well no, I, guess I mean i mean it's all, a it's lot all, of it's contacts all, yeah well it's well, well it's all it's all kind of kind of selling convincing people to trust you which is a number of things it's kind of like you know you've got to you've got to present your ideas and your thoughts but also i guess who you get introduced by if they trust them and they've got a relationship with them they will know that and, and if you've got a good relationship with them they wouldn't recommend you if they didn't trust you themselves because they know that you could let them down and i guess it's that chain of trust that probably made the biggest difference what's the biggest lesson you've learned from running your own company i mean pro probably the biggest bit of advice that i can kind of like pass on as such because i took it and i think that it was kind of good advice uh so i was trying to raise money and you know in my in my kind of like like business plan it was going to be raise x amount of money hire x amount of people start pitching for business you know that was the version kind of one and have x amount of income after the first year revenue this that or the rest of it and essentially that version meant speaking to people that were you know looking to invest in your business potentially giving away you know, well definitely giving away kind of like share of some sort of your business ultimately having other people be involved in the potential management of your business probably before you were even sure of what the thing was going to be and and then suddenly it's going to be maybe directed in that way or that way um and also commitment you know pressure financial debt you know all that kind of stuff um and you know expectations suddenly a team that you're managing and um and having kind of responsibilities mouse to feed all the rest of it uh so so it was, it was only when i spoke to kind of people that were more from a financial background and also i spoke to someone else's chairman for example who had nothing to do with the industry at all um and and they were like um it got me to think very carefully about you know what money i took in and who was involved in the business in some way or form and not that they had any view or opinion, but the consistent thing I got from speaking to people who had been there, done it before, was they almost like consistently regretted a little bit the investments they got. Mm. You know, so in some cases it was a bit like they knew they couldn't have done it without, without it, but they all had this sense of, oh, you know, we gave away a lot and we, or we had to give away a lot to pay that person out or, or they interfered too much or they didn't went there at all and we thought they were going to be really good for contacts and things like that. And, um, and I think that, you know, the whole kind of like when you're invested in, you know, the distraction you might find by having to report, having to check in, having to always show you've got this kind of like you know, growth plan and all the rest of it can distract you from just being brilliant at the thing it is that you do. Mm. Yeah. Plus, if you like the idea of getting out of employment and having a boss and being your own boss, to suddenly then have a boss again is not so appealing. Yeah, I mean, there are good ba bosses and there are bad bosses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but absolutely, no matter how good the boss is, it, it's hard not to take their opinions and let them kind of shape you in a certain direction. And I say that in terms of, while also saying, you know, get a mentor and have this kind of, you know, people that can give you advice. But when I say people, I mean a bunch of people as well. You know, it's not just that like one person is going to have the perfect answer. You know, if you've got a few people to potentially kind of knock things around with, then you'll probably be able to take the overall view. The, 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 you know, you're supposed to see there's some themes and then pick a view that probably isn't consistent with one person alone, but is, is a theme that runs through what all three are kind of like saying, and that's probably the best answer. You're someone who talks a lot about in the industry about the change that the industry needs. What message do you have for the advertising industry about the change that, that needs to happen from your perspective um so i sit on a number of different 
um, kind of board positions. That let's, let's call them extracurricular things that are outside of my kind of day job, but they are industry related things. So I'm co-chair of the Alliance of Independent Agencies. I am um, a co-chair of uh, the Conscious Advertising Network's GSD board. Um, I set the Marketing Society board. And I'm one of the founding members of MIFA, Media for All. Um, those are kind of, you know, certain positions. I also sit on, you know, the UK FE's uh, kind of board committee as well, which is a position I've held for a long, long time, helping with the awards and things. Um, so all of those represent an element of something that I kind of care about that I think the industry needs to kind of like, you know, potentially change. But there's a common theme of, you know, diversity being quite a big thing of some of those things I've mentioned there. Oh, I also didn't mention, I'm also a trustee of Brixton Finishing School, which is also kind of industry related and about, about, you know, giving more opportunities to people that deserve it, that are creative, that are qualified, that are brilliant, you know, making it easier for people to, um, you know, deliver their best work, be their best selves, you know, have the best time and ultimately, you know, make the industry a better place because the industry has been for many, many years suffering from a lack of trust, a reputation that externally, you know, it keeps dwindling in a sense, people think, thinking that, you know, advertising is something that, you know, it's just like bad salesmen kind of do in a sense. It's the level of creative output has been going down over time in terms of making kind of like, you know, really kind of ads that people just love to watch and really kind of understand. The kind of the moral side and the ethics of what advertising has been doing has been kind of wrong for a while and funding, you know, kind of propaganda, hate speech, um, causing kind of, you know, problems with child well-being and harm you know we're not taking enough responsibility for those things and i think that the reason why we're not taking enough responsibility one of the reasons is because the way in which advertising has been run as an you know as, as, as an industry is by too much homogeneity <laughs> um rather than people that can challenge feel comfortable to challenge people at the right levels and feel like they won't lose their job as a result or anything like that you know the comfort that kind of psychological safety to say you know, that's not necessarily right or what about if we do things this way or or let's let's challenge the client for example about why they don't want a black person in their advert because it's going out in europe or something you know um these things haven't happened you know kind of kind of enough um and ultimately you know i talk about how you know, we talk about ourselves being a creative industry, but I think that we are so much in our early days of creative potential because, and, uh, and I look at an industry like music and think about it pre Motown and think, mm -hmm. all right, you know, what the future looks like in that sense. And if we look at advertising and think about it in the same kind of way, you know, in a world and time when it's like similar people at the, you know, at the important levels, then we've got a long way to go and it will just be, we'll all be much better for it in terms of the work that we produce and the, the industry we, we create. So we're a very young kind of early stage of the industry. And ultimately it's kind of like, um, you know, if you've, if you've seen the research and you've heard the stories of the people that have suffered from bullying, harassment, whatever, you know, racism, you know, it, it's, it's something that you feel quite strongly about needs to change pretty quickly and can't be tolerated um yeah and uh what's your perspective i'm sure there's many answers to this but on on how how does that change happen the solution is ultimately getting more uh, diversity in role model positions with actual kind of power control to you know, make the right decisions do things differently change policy rather than it always being some kind of campaign pledge and you know, a letter that people sign, actual kind of change happens. But also just in terms of the representation at the right levels allows people at other levels to, you know, just contribute fully and feel like they can, you know, in full kind of comfort and have that kind of psychological safety to be involved. Um, but I think it's also about, you know, making sure that the senior people in the industry keep on having these client facing revenue generating kind of positions where they can feel confident enough in themselves as well that they are not just reporting in this big long line of a global organization with many multiple bosses um that they can make decisions for their teams and their people on a local level that kind of can really change their their well-being and their feeling about the job and 
And I also think that the uh, the other kind of key part that needs to change is we don't often talk about the client side. We talk about agencies a lot, and there are lots of differences in depending on what type of agency you are and you know the sides of the industry. So, for example, there is a lot more diversity in the media side compared to the creative side. For example, at the at higher levels, um, and there are sides of the industry that are really quite poor. So, you know, we can't. We don't talk enough about the fact that marketing departments are some of the worst culprits. Um, if you look at a list of the top CMOs or whatever, you know you can see that on any list, the majority of diverse people that they've got on there are actually got international roles, and they're probably like you know, American and whatever else. You know, in terms of, and there are a few. You know, there's there's not that many, but the people that are there are are not not truly the uh, the people that came through the. The, the 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 British ranks as such in terms of in marketing, so I think that there's a lot of responsibility that needs to be taken on the client side. You know, they need to turn them turn the, that kind of lens back on themselves and change the cultures there and the people and the diversity there and the makeups there. And then I think agencies and companies react very quickly when the client really means mm. something in that space. Mm. Yeah, great. And what's, what's your message to anybody that feels like they are facing discrimination? There are some great organizations and support networks of so things like NABS. You know, you've, you've got to, you know, pay, put a lot of value for some of that, you know, to speak to counselors and to, to the people, the people who are much, have much more expertise in talking through potentially traumatic, you know, experiences, which I think is, is one thing to definitely do because, you know, unfortunately the, the, the easy answer would be, oh yeah, report it internally and, you know, and, and, and make sure it gets escalated. But unfortunately we know that people report things internally that doesn't go any further. We know that people then also believe that HR is also necessarily looking out in their best interest. Sometimes they're looking out for the company's best interest, which is what they're employed to do. But, you know, the good HR people should, you know, again, be prepared to lose their job of some things that, you know, that shouldn't be happening are happening. Um, you, you, um, I think you need to, again, that's the benefit of having some outside counsel mentorship that you can talk to, to, you know, to tell you whether, how significant, severe, whether you're overreacting or not to any particular thing. You can't always trust the, you know, the person in your team or whatever. Because, you know, they're, they're also employed by the same company and, you know, they might just be thinking about keeping their job, you know. Um, so you need to get advice from outside in that sense. So I would, you know, I mean, you know, people like Media for All, you know, a good kind of mentoring kind of networks as well as part of what, you know, they do. But there's also things like Lollipop Mentoring for Black Women, um, you know, Bloom, um, Wackle, you know, they, they all have their kind of mentoring kind of schemes really. So... You know, join the one that you're comfortable with that seems to fit, you know, be designed for people like you and use it and use it not just when times are tough, you know, mm. because it's probably really hard to do once you've got a really serious problem suddenly and you're trying to tap into some kind of mentoring network and it's like, all oh, the program started a few months ago and, you know, you weren't interested then or whatever else. It's quite hard suddenly to get that advice. You know, it, it's kind of like mentoring is just one of those things of just, regularly checking in and making sure that you're you know the, the ship that you're on is just being constantly nudged in the right path and not going off off course to hit the iceberg great great metaphor <laughs> yeah fantastic so i've got one more question actually mm. and that was that over lockdown you were part of our unify sessions mm. what did you see was the benefit of bringing that those kind of people around the same table the, the, the massive benefit of bringing those kind of people around the table is, you know, a lot of people might support something in their company. They could be a lone voice in that company. And it's pretty um, demotivating, I guess, if you seem to be the person that's always, you know, blowing the same trumpet mm -hmm. about diversity or equality or whatever it is. And it's easy to be kind of cast aside there, particularly in a, in a, um, a world or a company that is already skewed in one direction by the makeup and demographic of the people in charge, you know, you could 
very easily be seen to you're, you're, you're a minority even if you're a woman in a situation or whatever else you can be very quickly seen to be the minority and just uh, a lone kind of mad voice as such so absolutely in terms of the the benefit of it is was definitely getting s senior people from different parts of the industry who equally cared um, and agreed fundamentally about the the key thing was leading by example and committing time and attention and willingness to d drive action but also suggesting ideas you know the the, the the only way you sell an idea is if you convince someone that it's you know it's kind of part of their they've been part of it as their idea and it's great and it's solving their kind of problem they need and you need to have their involvement as part of that so um you know if there is a problem the people that are the problem have to be part of that solution um and i think that that was the the great thing about it in terms of getting a lot of those people in the room you know there were tons of people that should have been in that room that weren't but there were enough to inspire the people that were in that room that change could happen and there wasn't you know there was they weren't the lone crazy voice in the office so to summarize mm. we'll share some lessons that we've got from your journey i think are valuable for others i think your story is a great one for really you know, like having some strategy to your life mm. and career and what you want and sticking to decisions that make sense to you personally you know and using that inner voice that says i know there's nike and you know amsterdam and mm. all this but no this this feels right or this sounds right this is more what you're about and not getting pulled away by you know the dream let's say um that might not be real so i think that's a great lesson for us just staying true to what you know is is best for you and it's worked great for you and also that the 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 level of um yeah commitment it takes to go and start your own thing and do that and persevere through through it is uh is never easy so um you're an inspiration for people who want to do that and uh someone who's done it successfully so uh thanks for sharing your story and um yeah that's what i got from it ash can share his yeah, perspective i think you covered a lot of a lot of the main points there charles in terms of pushing forwards always pushing forwards but also not losing touch of where you are and how you want to live you know as you, as you mentioned when you looked at the when you looked at the amsterdam opportunity it looked like a good opportunity but it didn't make sense for where you were. So why uproot and try something that wasn't natural for where you were at that time? And also, as you said, to not be, to not become a slave or at mercy to things that keep you in a certain place just because. I think that's a really powerful one for, 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 for people to take on because that's allowed you to move up in your career and then move out to do your own thing. You're not bound by certain things that can bound people into positions for you know longer than they actually really want to. Dino story, ladies and gentlemen, that is it. Thanks for joining us. Yes, thanks for joining us. Any final words? Any sh words of wisdom for people watching, listening? I hope they're not bored. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> the journey will continue. Exactly. Will continue. What is next for Dino? Nobody knows. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, Dino. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>